What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Lights Out. Today, we are diving into England's most haunted castle. The castle we're going to be taking a look at today is Chillingham Castle. Chillingham stood as a checkpoint for troops crossing into Scottish territory. It's gained the reputation of being one of the most haunted castles in Europe. Legend has it that the seventh Earl of Tankerville hired an occultist to perform rites at the castle in the 1920s, Alistair Crowley. Some have heard the cries of pain and fear, and he's often seen in a passage. So from the world of spirits, there descends a bridge of light, connecting it with this, o'er whose unsteady floor that sways and bends, wander our thoughts above the dark abyss. Light out, everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Lights Out. I'm your host, Josh. This is my co-host, Austin. Hey, what's up, guys? And our producer, Daniel. How's it going, everybody? Today, we are diving into England's most haunted castle, or so they say. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> the castle we're going to be taking a look at today is Chillingham Castle, and this castle has extensive history going back, what, thousands of years at this point? Yeah. And I love that. I love a, a paranormal place with a strong history. I think it, I don't know, it makes for a good story, right? It makes for a good story, and it makes for tons of paranormal activity, as, as you'll see today. A ton of ghost hunters and paranormal investigators. I mean, on YouTube, if you type in Chillingham Castle, you'll find a plethora of videos from various YouTubers and investigators over the years have gone there, stayed overnight, and have captured some very interesting activity here. We'll be showing you a little bit of that, but really today our goal is to give you a very extensive deep dive into the very dark and brutal history of this medieval castle. I mean, we all know the medieval times was just beyond anything I think most of us can comprehend, right? Yeah. Yeah, I uh it's it's one of the most fascinating time periods in history, but I feel like it's also one of the most gruesome and violent. With that said, I think plenty of people did live very peaceful lives during the medieval era, but I think when we look back on history, especially when you're talking about a castle and warfare, it just gets a little grimy. Grimy is an understatement. Yeah. I mean, it gets uh, torturous <laughs> yeah. at times as we'll see here at Chillingham Castle. But with that being said, shall we just dive in and start at the, the very beginning here. I'm ready. Let's do it. So the medieval Chillingham Castle sits in the northern part of Northumberland, England. It was a 12th century monastery for some time, and later it became an absolute stronghold. In its early days, an original manor house stood there, but it was destroyed by a Scottish raid in 1296 when the wars of Scottish independence began. In 1298, the manor was rebuilt, but this time it was fortified with stone. As the war between England and Scotland raged on, King Edward I stayed at this fortification while on his way to Scotland. He was headed to battle a Scottish army led by William Wallace. This is actually who Mel Gibson inaccurately portrayed in the very, very good movie, Braveheart, one of my favorite movies. Actually. Oh yeah, love that movie. It's funny because they say it's one of the most historically inaccurate movies, and like William Wallace wasn't even Braveheart. They like just got so much wrong. They took a lot of uh, liberties, but still a great movie. Great film. Yeah, great one. The stronghold of Chillingham ordered England and Scotland. Chillingham stood as a checkpoint for troops crossing into Scottish territory. Other times it was sieged by the Scottish, but a successful siege on this castle was nearly impossible because of its ultra-thick walls. Chillingham became a fortified castle by 1344 under Edward III after it underwent a series of enhancements or battlements were added. Towers were constructed, cells, and a torture chamber were added to the dungeon below. During the war, many of the battles here were violent and bloody. As we know, medieval warfare was uh, not not similar to how warfare is today. Violence still, but 
hand to hand combat is just a whole other very personal yeah definitely brutal and it was usually at the cost of the Scottish troops its walls and towers were so high that shooting arrows basically did nothing cannons wouldn't be available until several decades later and the troops would fall into the muddy moat when they approached the English defenders of the castle would stand on the walls and towers throwing hot oil and bodily fluids down at the Scottish troops until they would eventually retreat that that sounds horrific to me guess you gotta use what you got right you imagine getting like hot oil dumped on top of you yeah as you're sieging a castle or like piss yeah i'm like yeah i'm good i'm going home all the poop buckets just get unloaded on you there's human <laughs> feces you're getting burned with oil so yeah no thanks i think that would make me retreat real quick yeah the castle was still safe even when cannons and gunfire came into play some of its stone walls were built 10 to 15 feet thick that is a lot of stone and since it was so well fortified, it made a great place for royalty to stay. Some used it as a hunting lodge, others came for private visits on vacation. They'd sit by the roaring fireplaces in the dining room and feast on elk roast and strawberry jam as people burned alive outside. <laughs> as the screams echoed through the air and they're just hanging out. Having a great time behind the 10 to 15 foot thick walls. Eventually the war between England and Scotland ended in 1346 and over time the castle transformed. They filled the moat and converted some of the battlements into residential wings. A banquet hall and library were also installed. During World War II, the castle was used as an army barracks. The decorative wood inside was stripped and burned for warmth, and after the war, the castle fell into disrepair. The floorboards were gone and the lead roof was removed. The weather then began to damage large sections of the castle. It fell into disrepair and became a shell of what it used to be, and the owners had stopped maintaining it for years. Some of the earliest documented owners were the Earls of Tankerville, dating back to the mid-1200s, and they were in the Grey and Bennett families. Many of them belonged to the most noble order of the Garter. This is basically an order to connect the most powerful nobles to the king. Although most of them were loyal, eight family members were eventually executed for treason. They did not uh, take that lightly, treason, back then. Some were later hanged, drawn, and quartered even, and their heads were impaled on spikes as a warning some Game of Thrones shit, basically. Seriously. The members who remained loyal owned the castle up until the 1980s. Then the land was divided and sold. The castle's condition was so poor by then that the National Trust and the English Heritage didn't even want it. It says a lot. So in 1982, the castle was bought by Sir Humphrey Wakefield, whose wife Catherine was a descendant of the original Greys of Chilliam. At the time of its sale, dead pigeons and rats infested the castle, the roof was falling in, and the walls were crumbling. From then on, Sir Humphrey spent a small fortune to restore the castle to its former glory. During the restoration, supposedly several skeletal remains were uncovered. They had been buried in the walls or down in the dungeon below. The remains were removed, and much of the castle was restored to its original condition. The interior renovations and the landscape have changed throughout the years, but the actual structure of the castle remains the same. The architectural detail and its massive walls still stand where they did hundreds of years ago. The complex is shaped like a rectangle with a courtyard in the center. Four towers stand on each of the corners and one side is connected to a large garden. The opposite side has a few smaller buildings attached. Although much of the surrounding area has been cleared, there are still pockets of dense forest all around it. By 2020, sections of the castle were open to the public. This included eight rooms inside the castle and a few of the outbuildings that have also become available for holiday rentals. It is, uh, yeah, it's a very popular tourist attraction. Yeah, it's just like everyone and their mothers have been there, if even remotely interested, and a lot of it we'll see is the paranormal, but honestly, just if you look at pictures of this place, it looks like an awesome place to I'd stay. I'd love to and, visit it. Yeah, and just to check out how beautiful it is, and like the garden is massive, it looks awesome, there are little hiking trails all around. Have you ever been in a castle? No, never, Me not neither. once. Have you, Danny, been in a castle? Yeah, I actually have. I've been to uh, a couple castles in Ireland, not uh, England, though. Oh, really? Yeah. What was your What was your thoughts? Were you like shocked by how big they were and just how they were built, or were you kind of underwhelmed? No, I was honestly pretty shocked on how they were built. They're a lot smaller than you think on the inside. Like they're these grand things on the outside, but they are quite small and cramped on the inside, which makes sense. But I felt cramped going up the stairs. I felt cramped going through doorways. It's 
It's really cool, I'll be honest, but they are a lot smaller on the inside than you'd expect. Yeah. Mm. Especially if you have like 10 to 15 foot thick walls. Yeah. I'm assuming the interior is kind of small. Not a lot of natural lighting. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> How many windows do they have? Uh, the one I went to, not really any windows. I, uh, but I do have a life goal of mine is to go to Prague Castle. That's yeah. the one I really want to go to. I think it's, I think it's technically the largest castle system in the world. It just looks incredible, and it's been really well maintained through the years. And I also just want to go to Prague. It's an awesome city. That would be cool. Yeah. You can. It sounds like you can almost do a full Europe castle tour. Seriously, and yeah. see a bunch of castles. That's probably the closest thing we have to it is like a uh, Mesa Verde. Oh yeah. yeah, a lot of the indigenous true um, yeah. settlements are, are, are. I mean, many of them were destroyed, but there are still some. Mesa Verde in Colorado is actually really cool. I have been to that where they carved uh, their housing into like the rocks. Yeah. Uh, yep. Cliffs. You have to like to climb these really steep ladders to get up to them. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did that uh, a few times as a child. Those are really cool, but yeah, that's that's really about it for yeah. And I've seen like there was some grain silos that they had from the indigenous. I think it was the Utes. I can't remember because I was in Utah, but they had stuff like that. So I guess we do have have that in a sense. Over the years, the forest surrounding the castle was cleared to make space for the chilling and wild cattle. And you're probably like, can we get to the paranormal stuff? But I thought this was kind of interesting. Okay, so bear with me. This is actually a rare breed, and there are over a hundred of them in this enclosed park on the castle grounds. And these rare untamed cattle are one of the reasons for the castle's tourism, because there's some of the last wild untamed cattle in the world. There's actually, like, I didn't realize this, but there's actually, like, no untamed cattle, really. Wild cattle anymore. It's all... Interesting. They're all on ranches. I didn't even know that or, was a thing. Yeah. So it's very rare, and a lot of people come here. They're also a very white cattle, so people come here to just check them out but besides the cattle chilium has a much darker side that has drawn probably more attention uh worldwide it's gained the reputation of being one of the most haunted castles in europe so sir humphrey also began hosting these late night ghost tours in recent years and you can also pay to ghost hunt around the castle through the night which is kind of cool because i know not a lot of places allow you to stay the night at these and kind of we'll see in a little bit that these teams of ghost hunters kind of have some free reign in the castle. But as its popularity grew, it soon became known as one of the most haunted castles in England, and some say there are as many as 100 ghosts that roam the grounds, which is, that's quite a lot. A poem by the famous poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow was supposedly inspired by Chillingham Castle. And I'm, I'm going to read you this some poetry. Poem. Yeah. Excellent. I know there's probably people rolling their eyes like, can you just get to the paranormal crap already? But, I didn't come here for poetry. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'll, I'll try to make it. Tell fun, us this right? poem. So this is called Haunted Houses. All houses wherein men have lived and died are haunted houses through the open doors. The harmless phantoms of their errands glide with feet that make no sound upon the floors. We meet them at the doorway, on the stair, along the passages they come and go, impalpable impressions on the air, a sense of something moving to and fro. There are more guests at table than the hosts, invited the illuminated halls, is thronged with quiet, inoffensive ghosts, as silent as the pictures on the wall. The stranger at my fireside cannot see the forms I see nor hear the sounds I hear. He but perceives what is, while unto me, all that has been is visible and clear. We have no title deeds to house or lands, owners and occupants of earlier dates, from graves forgotten stretch their dusty hands and hold in mortmain still their old estates. The spirit world around this world of sense floats like an atmosphere and everywhere, wafts through these earthly mists and vapors dense, a vital breath of more ethereal air. Our little lives are kept in equipoise by opposite attractions and desires, the struggle of the instinct that enjoys and the more noble instinct that aspires. These perturbations, this perpetual jar, 
of earthly wants and aspirations high come from the influence of an unseen star, an undiscovered planet in our sky. And as the moon from some dark gate of cloud, there's o'er the sea a floating bridge of light across whose trembling planks our fasces crowd into the realm of mystery and night. So from the world of spirits there descends a bridge of light, connecting it with this, o'er whose unsteady floor that sways and bends, wander our thoughts above the dark abyss. Wow. That just shook me to my core, man. Whew. If you're still with us, <laughs> you're still there. Hello. Took a, took a little you, poetry um, break there. Can you explain what this means? What? <laughs> and what kind of poem is this, Mr. Writing Major? I think he's basically just very inspired by this concept of the haunted house, the haunted building. And he's kind of just explaining all these things in that medieval we terms. In, yeah, in kind of in old medieval language. language. Yeah. How uh, they connect us to this ethereal plane, the spirit world. And uh, there's something in it, there's something inherent about property, about these places, these physical places that connect us. Mm, I like it. That's what I got from it. I don't know <laughs> if you guys, he might have been talking about something else. <laughs> very, very. Uh, I love the delivery. Thank Round you. of applause for <laughs> Austin's delivery on that for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Well, let's talk about what you all came here for. The evil that has resided within this castle. We're going to talk about John Sage, or John Dragfoot, as he's known. One legend of Chillingham Castle dates back centuries. During the bloody years of war between England and Scotland, many Scottish men died at the hands of a man named John Sage. He had been nicknamed John Dragfoot, and he's also been called the Butcher of the Scots and the epitome of evil. And you'll see why. He was a lieutenant serving on the front lines, but he suffered an injury to one of his legs, which caused him to limp and he could no longer fight in the war. He begged Edward I to give him another job and Edward had noticed how sadistic John was. So he's like, hmm, I got the perfect job for you there, buddy. So they decided to keep him in the castle as their torturer and executioner. During his three years at Chillingham, it's said that he tortured hundreds, possibly thousands of men who were prisoners of war. Sometimes he would even torture women and children. Apparently, he tortured more than 50 people a week, which I think you got to be a sadistic fuck. To do yeah, that. that's an insane quota. He'd often use thumb screws, a famous medieval torture device who was made to clamp down on victims' fingers or toes. As John would screw the metal clamp tighter on the fingers or toes, the metal plate would eventually shatter the bones. Sometimes spiked plates were added for a more sadistic version. Victims were also put inside iron cages and left to die. Others were impaled on spikes or beheaded on the block. Supposedly, John Sage also used the rack. This was a device famous for its use in the Tower of London. John would use a similar one down in the torture room. He'd pull on ropes tied to a victim's wrists and ankles and this stretched the body and dislocated the victim's joints. But once John got bored of that, he would use the scavenger's daughter, which did the exact opposite of the rack. This A-frame metal device would compress the body until blood would pour from the eyes and ears. Whew, I, don't know, I don't know what's worse, getting stretched to yeah, death or, or getting compressed to death. They both seem awful. I don't know. I would, I would just vote for the block yeah just, just, just cut my, my head, head off, off please yeah. like <laughs> please don't stretch me <laughs> today's episode is sponsored by acorns acorns helps you automatically save and invest for your future because let's be real investing can definitely be intimidating so intimidating that sometimes it feels easier to just push it off if you can identify with that today's sponsor might be just the thing to kick you into gear what's great about acorns is you don't need a lot of money to get started. You can even start by investing your spare change with roundups. This is a really cool concept that is unique to Acorns, and it really is a great place to start if you've never gotten into investing before. Basically how it works is you set up your account with Acorns, 
and it tracks all of your expenses that you do on your debit card, credit card. And every time you make a transaction, it rounds up that total and whatever, you know, the spare changes in that transaction, it then takes that money and it invests it for you, which is great. I also love all the education resources that it has. It really does make it very simple to learn the basics of investing. They also give you kickbacks on select retailers. So it's just a great place to start your investing journey. So if you're interested, head over to acorns.com slash lights out to sign up for acorns to start saving and investing in your future today. Investing involves risk, including the loss of principal. Please consider your objectives, risk tolerance and acorns fees before investing. Acorns Advisors LLC Acorns is an SEC registered investment advisor. Brokerage services are provided to clients of Acorns by Acorns Securities LLC. It's member FINRA SIPC. For more information, visit acorns.com. There is also an oubliette installed somewhere in the torture chambers. This was a secret dungeon accessed through a trap door above. John would trick the victims over to this trap door and they would fall down into the cramped dungeon room where they would be trapped until their death. When he would get bored of the traditional torture methods, he would begin to invent his own torture devices. One of his favorite methods was hammering dozens of iron nails into a large wooden barrel. There are several lakes and ponds near the castle, and near one of the larger lakes, there's said to be a steep hill. So what John would do is he would stuff his victims into the nail-filled barrels, and then roll them down the hill into the lake. Oh, God. Gross. So as you can imagine, they'd be inside the barrel, being played to death as the barrel rolled down the hill, and sometimes he would roll two at a time down the hill, to race them for fun. It's said if you find the lake and reach down into the water, invisible hands will grab you and pull you to the bottom. Apparitions of children can also be seen running along the water's edge. When John wasn't torturing the Scottish prisoners, he would also act as an executioner when needed, and some say he killed up to 1,000 people. By the end of the war, the English needed to get rid of its Scottish prisoners, so what's a great way to just get rid of a lot of people at one time? Well. They built a bonfire in the castle's courtyard. After the fire was lit, men, women, and even children were dragged out and thrown into the flames. The ghosts of those who burned alive can still be seen in the courtyard today. Sometimes disembodied voices can be heard, including screams and people gasping for air. The youngest children were spared, but they had to watch their friends and family burn alive. Then they were taken to King Edward's personal quarters, and here it's believed that 50 of the youngest children were butchered to death by John Sage with an axe. It's wild to me because this place is so beautiful and I feel like it would be very surreal to stand in this courtyard where it's, I don't know, it's this fascinating castle Knowing. complex. Yeah, or you go out to the lake and you know it's all these nasty things were happening. It's I just couldn't get over the thought of like how much blood was spilled. Right, yeah. All over this place. I mean, to kill 50 children with an axe inside the castle that that image alone is disgusting in the king's chambers too so like, he was a sadistic fuck too maybe he was watching or it seems like why it, in or, his chambers right and it seems like he would be the guy calling the shots too right would be the king so i don't know but they were all sick man yeah and to make it even worse supposedly these children were killed because the english were afraid that the scottish children would retaliate once they were adults so they just watched all their friends and family get burned to death and then they kind of second guess like, oh, mm. well, what do we do with these kids now who just experienced this? Like we let them live. We'll have to fight them later. So right. We'll just get rid of them now. Yeah. God. Very horrific. So today, many visitors have seen the apparitions of young children inside King Edward's room. And another ghost known as Key has also been seen in Edward's room, but it's not really clear what his history is, if he has some connection to this butchering or not, I'm not sure, but he's known for grabbing people's ankles and other times he will trap people in chairs by putting pressure on their thighs or shoulders. People have experienced this strange pressure when they're sitting down in the room. But at some point during the years of violence at Shillingham, John Sage, quote, accidentally killed his girlfriend, Elizabeth Charlton, which it's crazy that this guy- Accidentally. Even, right? Get, give me a break. And like, it's kind of strange that this guy even had a girlfriend. Like, oh, what's, what, uh, what, what are you up to on your day to day? Oh, just torturing and executing people constantly. 
I, I have charming. to think this was like a forced relationship though. That's probably I mean it was a, a different point. time back then and like men, you know, kind of ruled. True. And so my guess was that this was his this girl probably did not want to be this dude's girlfriend. That's a good point. Like, and he probably had some status at the castle just because of the nature of his job. So yeah, that's a good point. But she had come to visit him from a border town and John was locking up the dungeons for the night. They went up to his quarters and were fooling around in the bedroom. John claimed that he accidentally strangled her too hard during intercourse here. But after this uh, accident, as he would say, John's streak of torture and murder would finally come to an end. So Elizabeth's father was actually the chief of a tribe of border bandits, which were, I guess, really common during this era. And he soon heard about what happened to his daughter and he called BS. He knew there was something going on. So he threatened to join the Scottish army in an attack against the castle if they didn't do anything about it. So to avoid confrontation, British authority finally punished John Sage after all these years. And after endless crimes against humanity, John was finally handed over to the Charlton clan. So you could probably understand that they were all pissed and this guy was disgusting. So this angry mob of the Charlton clan ended up cutting off all his fingers, all his toes. Then they continued to cut off his lips, nose, and genitals as they hung him by the neck. So karma caught up to him, man. Yeah, really. What a way to go out, right? I mean, I think that was uh, probably deserved yeah. for uh, everything that he did. Yeah, seriously. Before we continue the story of Mr. Uh, John Dragfoot and what happens after he, he dies, Oh, uh, I wanted to play just a little snippet from the YouTube channel Amy's Crypt. Uh, they actually went out to Chillingham Castle and they uh, experienced some very strange activity during an EVP session they had in King Edward's room. And I just thought it'd be uh, worth sharing because it gives you a little bit more perspective into not only what the castle looks like if you're watching, but also, you know, and kind of hear some uh, strange things that they capture. King Edward's room is claimed to be one of the more haunted and darker areas of the castle, and from the moment we entered the room and began to set up, we captured activity, with our REM pod triggering, noises occurring, and orbs appearing in our footage. Bring your cat balls? No. Should we go? It's too late now, I'm not going back down. <gasps> oh, hello? Thank you. Um, <gasps> what the heck? REM pod's gone off, there's noise behind us. Um, what the heck? Um, what the heck? Alright. What? Um, okay. What are we doing? I don't know, but I need to sit down, possibly. The drums do not sit on these. This is going nuts. Okay, we're about to do... An EVP session. Thank you if you're trying to communicate with us and sitting at the table with us. That is so freaky that the REM pod is just going nuts. I don't want to be the one sitting next to the REM pod. Do you swap? Nah. <laughs> I don't want to be the one sitting next to this chair. I swear there may be bats up there. <gasps> with so much happening, we decided to hit record on an EVP session to see if we could pick up on any voices. My name is Amy and I'm sitting here with this guy named Jared and we call out to the spirits in King Edward's room. We know there's someone in here because someone grabbed Jared. Can you tell us who this is? Can you tell us whether you consider us a friend or a foe? Who was it that moved the glove, the metal glove on the table? <gasps> and can you move it again? <laughs> You're going near that red light, that's where the gloves are. Maybe you can move them for us. Can you tell us how long you've been here for? Are there any children in here? What was that? Was that you? 
No, there was like a knock on the table. Can you make a louder noise for us? Can you just yell something really loud? I feel very unnerved in here. I'm just gonna play this back now. Riveting. <laughs> They're using a REM pod, which I had to look up. I didn't know what a REM pod was. Yeah, it's basically a device that just, it's supposed, it has an antenna that basically like scans 360 degrees and picks up fluctuations in electromagnetic uh, energy and I believe temperature as well, some of them. Gotcha. Um, and basically it, those lights go off. So, I mean, hard to say what's triggering those. I mean, obviously, People believe that it's, you know, spirits potentially moving around, uh, movement, things like that. In uh, the one clip, briefly, they pointed an arrow to the top right corner where they indicated maybe an orb uh, was moving through the shot. And, and that's the thing with, like, paranormal investigations. A lot of it you don't really necessarily hear, pick up in the moment because it's so quiet or yeah, you just, yeah. especially, like, orbs and stuff, you don't really see till after the fact. Mm-hmm. Um, people say the same about like even the old investigations like with film photography it wouldn't be until after they developed the film where they would notice something in it exactly so they were i mean they were in king edward's room where you know allegedly 50 children were executed with an axe right uh so you can imagine that there's uh definitely something going on in there so the phantom of John Dragfoot is actually still seen at the castle to this day. And when his name has been called, objects in the castle have moved in response and things like music boxes have been activated without anyone touching them. John's apparition is often seen as a man with a heavy build. He has a thick beard that's quote, as black as night. And he can be heard dragging his foot as he limps around the castle. It's the sound of a single footstep followed by a long scraping noise. Today, the public can tour John Dragfoot's torture chamber. It actually isn't the original torture chamber. Uh, it's one that they kind of set up to just depict. Here are some of the devices that he used, but the real one is actually located down beneath in the dungeons. And it's believed that at some point, at least as the story goes, a few visitors once snuck down there and they performed a botched seance inside the this torture chamber it's unclear exactly what happened during the seance but some believe they might have summoned some sort of spiteful entity possibly a demon but since then the room has now been sealed off with masonry so no one can access it but if you listen closely it's said that you can still hear the popping and cracking of invisible joints and ligaments that echo through the sealed torture room oh. which is gross Another familiar ghost is known as the Blue Boy, also known as the Radiant Boy, and he might have been a victim of John Sage all those years ago. His skeletal remains were discovered during renovation work centuries after his death. They were found close to what's known as the Pink Room. His skeleton was found surrounded by fragments of blue cloth and his fingers were broken. One theory suggests that the boy was bricked inside the wall while he was still alive, and he smashed his hands trying to escape. That is brutal, man. Be bricked alive? Oh my god. Oh. A childish apparition can now be witnessed near the pink room, usually around midnight. Some have heard the cries of pain and fear, and he's often seen in a passage that was opened through the 10-foot thick walls connected to the adjacent tower. A bright halo of light appears, and the figure of a boy dressed in bright blue clothing has been seen approaching those who sleep in the castle. Some claim that once the boy's remains were buried, they stopped seeing the figure, but when Sir Humphrey began renting out the castle rooms again, some guests complained of bright flashes of blue light shooting out of the walls. One visitor and his mother witnessed the flashing but thought, you know, oh, it's just somebody breaking the no flash photography rule. And they saw a bright flash in the pink room that had been roped off during a castle tour. It wasn't until later that they read about the blue boy in one of the tour books and realized that the flash might have actually been caused by him. Some have tried to explain the flashing lights as an electrical fault, but the owners claim that there's no electrical wiring in the pink room walls where guests and visitors have claimed to see these flashes. So this still remains a mystery today. The Blue Boy wasn't the only set of skeletal remains found inside the castle. According to legend, three more skeletons were found in the chapel. Two of them were found near the stained glass window, and the other was found in the back corner underneath the wooden floorboards. 
This one was the skeleton of a little girl. No one could tell who she was or how she died, but it's believed that her spirit still wanders the chapel and interacts with people. She only communicates with female visitors though, and she's known for waving her hands through visitors' long hair. When people come close to the corner where her remains were found, some have experienced a profound sense of sadness washing over them. Another ghost in the castle is simply known as Adam, and he's Richard Craig's favorite ghost. Richard is currently the resident ghost hunter at Chillingham Castle, and he's actually the one who's uncovered a lot of the, the spirit names and, and so on. So according to him, Adam was once a French mercenary who made tons of money while fighting for Scotland in the war. And he's also a little bit of a ladies' man, supposedly, even his spirit. So he's often seen with two of the female ghosts in the castle who are known as Lisa and Sally. Sally is actually the mother of Elena, who also resides in the castle. She's another ghost. It's unknown if Adam is her father. But Richard, the ghost hunter, has claimed to have contacted these ghosts commonly through a spirit box. And if you don't know what a spirit box is, it's a radio with a frequency scanner. It's similar to just a radio scanner, but it's designed to pick up electronic voice phenomena or EVP so you can listen to it and communicate with spirits, supposedly. They were invented in 2002, and ever since then, they've been a go-to device with all ghost hunters. I, I think any ghost hunter channel that you come across, they will most likely have a spirit box. The devices usually output this loud, stuttering white noise. Supposedly, the noise is meant to act as some form of energy gate to access the spirits. You can vocalize a question to the spirits, and if they respond, you should be able to essentially hear their voice or some sort of disturbance through this white noise. So, I don't know, how do you feel about spirit boxes? Do you think they're legit? It's hard to say, obviously, because, I mean, there's... There's no like scientific proof or explanation behind it. I think in theory, it's a good idea. And I mean, why not? I am skeptical of spirit boxes done on the phone. Yeah, um, definitely. When people use spirit box apps on the phone, I'm very, very skeptical of those. Um, Cause there's no way to actually pick up. It doesn't have like a radio antenna, you know, like it's the same reason why your phone doesn't pick up like AM, FM radio natively, right. right? Like, so it's just using the microphone on your phone and then the app is producing the, this frequency scanning. Right. But the, I mean, I have a EVP uh, device and I've used it before and I haven't had luck with it personally, but um, I do think, you know, there's cheap ones out there and then there's, you know, higher quality ones. But again, they're, you know, they're up to interpretation, right? Like, and what you hear through them um, is up to interpretation and it's like how do we know that this is how the ghosts are communicating and how how does it work right like yeah. i think that's the big question we all have is like how do they actually work like what's actually going on yeah um or is it just picking up interference you know right. radio signals things like that because i've seen some where it's like it'll be like the ch -ch -ch -ch, and then it'll be like is someone here and then it'll be like john and i'm like okay i don't I don't it's know like what's going on ghost, here. Yeah. yeah, and it's like, what are the chances that this ghost has a very, it's like a Midwestern accent? Well, I, I don't know that those are actually like, that's the ghost voice necessarily. I think, oh, it's, I think the device is translating or picking up the message and then relaying audibly it. relaying it to gotcha. what's going on. Okay, that yeah, would make more sense. Right, right. But I mean, a lot of the traditional spirit boxes if you do hear a voice, it's going to be like this muffled, like it's not going to be like this clear, audible, right? English voice that you're hearing. And yeah. You're kind of like, oh, that kind of sounded like you said get out or something like that versus uh, some of the other spirit boxes out there that actually like take the interference and then produce this like translator translation. Yeah, so, okay. That makes more sense then. But Richard has used the spirit box to communicate with dozens of these spirits in Chillingham. And he's been very successful at doing it. And his research is part of the reason why we have the names and descriptions of so many of the Chillingham ghosts today. And our buddies, Sam and Colby, they've also spent some time ghost hunting in Chillingham. Here's a, a short clip of them encountering some paranormal activity across the castle. Okay, so I know she's a woman and she wanted me to leave. <gasps> 
woman wants me to leave. Boom, turns on. Thank you so much. I know, I'm sorry. Just gonna be one more minute. I, okay. I know I told you I'd leave and literally right off the bat, you just said you didn't want me here and I respect that. Just for confirmation, you tap one of these. Oh my God. I'm gonna leave up here and I'm actually gonna go to a different spot. Is this where you live, Vern? Between. Did you make these scratches on the walls here? US. US. I heard footsteps in here before and I heard a loud- Shit. That sounds like something something evil would say. Is there a negative entity here by the name of John Sage that we need to be worried about? Please just give me an obvious sign. I heard you walking around here earlier. I heard a loud bang. If you can just make that happen again, I'll know that's the sign. Please just let me know. I want to help you. <gasps> what the fuck was that? That was the biggest fucking slam I've ever heard. That just gave me chills all over my body. Everybody probably heard that. Big bang. Just heard a big bang. Equate. Hello? What's that? Where's everyone? There is something evil here, guys, and that was the sign. I asked for an obvious sign. Bone chill. Yeah, their videos are always hype. Damn. The bang. I definitely heard the bang there. So it's like mm -hmm. there's definitely activity going on right there's definitely unexplained noises unexplained you know their their equipment's going off you've got the motion uh flashlights that are flipping on and on with motion i believe uh then you've got the rem pod in there as well and then they've got yeah. the the spirit box going there yeah so they got all the devices and i like how they split up too that makes it more interesting because a lot of these you'll just see it they're all in, in the group. same yeah. room and one room it's very static but i like how they're also they could he heard the big the loud bang in one room and the other guy which i think he was in a cell also heard the big bang i don't know definitely makes for a more interesting ghost hunt another app i'm excited to tell you about today is rocket money if i asked you how many subscriptions you have would you be able to list them all and also tell me how much you're paying if you would have asked me this question before i started using rocket money i would have said yes for sure because subscriptions are one of the hardest things to track i swear it's easy to sign up for them but it's even harder to keep track of them, let alone cancel them. But thanks to Rocket Money, they've made this process of managing subscriptions and canceling subscriptions an absolute breeze. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, it monitors your spending, and even helps lower your bills. All things that all of us should be doing and taking advantage of. I can see all my subscriptions in one place, and if I see something I don't want, I can cancel it with just a tap of a button. I never have to get on the phone with customer service, which is the last thing I have time for these days. They'll even try to get you a refund for the last couple of months of wasted money and negotiate to lower your bills for you by up to 20%. All you have to do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. I pay for a premium subscription with Rocket Money. You know, it's free to, free to try it out. And it is worth, I think like the 10 bucks a month I pay for it because it really is a great way to manage my finances. I have a bunch of different accounts and credit cards and it puts it all into one place. It organizes my expenses so I can see how much I'm spending on, you know, household utilities or groceries or gas, or whatever it may be. And it's really, really simple to use. And it's an app I open almost every single day. Rocket Money has over 5 million users, including myself, and has helped save its members on average $720 a year with over $500 million in canceled subscriptions. I know someone out there has all these streaming services that you're paying for and you don't even realize it because maybe you started a free trial. They all give you free trials, but you have to obviously input your credit card or, or on your phone, especially. So many apps require subscriptions now and it's so easy to sign up for them. And then you just forget about it. And sometimes it can be cumbersome to search through your phone settings in order to cancel those subscriptions. Well, let Rocket Money take care of it for you. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash lights out. That's rocketmoney.com slash lights out. Check it out today at rocketmoney.com slash lights out. But here's a fun fact. Countless other ghost hunters and occultists have visited the castle over the past few centuries. And according to Richard, the, the resident ghost hunter, legend has it that the seventh Earl of Tankerville hired an occultist to perform rites at the castle in the 1920s and that occultist was our 
another good buddy of ours, the famous Alistair Crowley. Um, if you don't know Alistair, he's we've covered him in a, in a few of our episodes. The here. Great Beast. Yeah. Yeah. He was the founder of the religion Thelema and regarded as one of the most powerful occultists of his time. But the idea was that they invited him to try and protect the castle and the Earl from witchcraft and the supernatural. So even, you know, back in the 1920s, they were kind of experiencing these problems. And of course, who better to call? Yeah. Than Alistair, I don't know if he's going to summon anything worthwhile here. Uh, the problem was that he just made it worse. Uh, he performed essentially some rituals there and people think he might have just cracked open a bigger supernatural portal here, which would also explain why there's so much more at paranormal activity at the property to this day. I tend to uh, lean towards that this is a legend rather than a fact. I think to yeah. attach Alistair Crowley to your castle uh, just adds that much more yeah. intrigue and uh, suspense for I, people. I couldn't find any documentation that he actually went there. This was relayed by Richard Craig, the the resident ghost hunter there. Well, and just the whole reason for him coming there doesn't really line up for me because if you know anything about Alistair Crowley, he's very into sex magic. Yep. Right? Sex magic was his thing. Um, so you invited him to come and perform sex magic rituals at the castle in order to protect the castle. And Earl from Witchcraft and the Supernatural is like, what is really doing quite the opposite. He's really interested in uh, using sex magic to open up. Right, right. Portal. Whoa. That's always the paranormal. Always Alice Crowley. Holy that's shit. your mic. That's wild. Oh, yeah. What is Alistair, are you here with us? What the hell? It's always it's always Josh's mic. You're the target. They don't fuck with me because they know I won't believe it. <laughs> Hello? We're good? Th this is what happens. Whenever we talk about this shit, this is what happens in here. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is more paranormal than what's happening in this <laughs> at this point. This is more real to me because what the actual fuck was that? Now my mic's completely fine. This cable is virtually new. It was working completely fine. Riddle me that. How 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 this happened? We should start running some of those devices. Just I think we need on, to on hand. Just I'm have gonna, them on hand during these episodes. I'm gonna go get my ghost hunting kit. And just set it up in here and yeah, just start. We just put it like in the corner or something and just see just, if it detects anything. I should at least bring the EMF in here and see what the fuck is fucking with these microphones. Seriously. That is so weird though. It's when I'm talking specifically about Aleister Crowley, shit goes haywire. Can't explain it. Well, thank you, Alistair, <laughs> for making your presence known in our episode. We really appreciate it. Be so. Before alistair gave us a sign here i was gonna say what if you know he's super into sex magic what if the seventh earl of tankerville john montague bennett was like i'm inviting alistair crowley here to and they're like well, for what and he's like well he's not gonna say sex magic so he's yeah. just like he's gonna cleanse the the house and the spirits out of here and stuff it's all gonna be cool but they actually just went to a closed private room and did their thing did their thing together mm. um, Oh, all right. Well, that was not uh, creeped out at all now, but that was very strange. It's weird. I've never heard my mic go that distorted though, randomly. Yeah, that like, was like I've fun. heard random buzzing and like more typical kind of like audio issues, but that was just straight like complete distortion in the microphone. Yeah, I didn't do anything. Daniel, are you pressing buttons over there? <laughs> yeah. You trying to bait us over here? <laughs> Well, there you have it. Paranormal's real. Yeah, confirmed. Confirmed <laughs> here today. That was so weird. That was wild. What the hell? Yeah, so this is uh, another uh, popular YouTube channel, Seth Borden, and he went out there with a couple other YouTubers uh, exploring with Josh, who I'm a big fan of, not, not just because we have the same name, but <laughs> great channel as well. Uh, they did an overnight stay in uh, Chilliam Castle, and Here's what they experienced. Is John or Edward here? King Edward. Right. 
Right. The flashlights are bright. Let's see what happens if we turn off all the lights. All right, we shut the lights off. It's not bright anymore. Can you help us out? Give us a sign that you're here. Maybe a thump, a knock. Murderer. 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 Oh my god. Yo, Evil murderer John. too. John. It's like John. Oh, lights just come on. <gasps> the lights just come on. Oh, oh my god. Oh my god. Bro, it's yeah, like he stepped forward into us all. Yo, I'm getting goosebumps right now. John, Holy is that crap. you? Who's Holy sitting? God. If you're John, can you turn it Bro, off? Bro, something's there. <gasps> you Yo. What did you just say? If you're John, can you turn it off? Oh my god. John's here. Oh. And it just said evil murderer, and this has been going with the whole story. Exactly. Leave. 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 Oh my god. Leave. Leave. Oh my god. Why do you want us to leave, John? <gasps> out. Out. It wants us out. Oh my. Out. Oh my I knew it's saying out again. It wants us out of here. Dude. He's, he wants us out, bro. bro. You want us to go to your room? I just heard a footstep on the I other know. side of the table. Same. I think they're just standing there telling us to get the hell out of here, and they're right in front of us, but behind the king's chair. All right, so do they want us to leave the castle, or do they want us to leave this room? I don't know. Quiet. 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 So he it told us to leave, like, multiple times, clear evidence with a flashlight. It only makes sense to go to the chapel or to the king's room. Oh, shit. So they were in the, like, the dining room great hall area for that um fun little tidbit those those uh fireplaces are actually fake uh, oh, really they were installed for a movie that was shot there uh i can't remember which one but then they just kept it there because it looked cool <laughs> that's cool yeah but that room's awesome um and i know i think that's where in the same and colby one one of them was also in that same room and then the other clip i wanted to share is actually from this past Halloween. And this is a, a self-proclaimed spiritual medium, uh, Stephen Crawford. And he shares a little bit of his experience being at Chillingham Castle. I'm Stephen. That's Crawford, the same room. Uh, spiritualist medium. I got invited last year to um, come along as, as guest spiritualist, guest medium. Um, I suppose to help bring spirit forward. Um, I've been doing this the last 15 years and it's, it's something that is, I suppose has been instilled into us, not just as a, as a job and as a, as a belief yeah. system, but this place itself, this place is drenched in spiritual history with a bit of misery mixed in, which is always a good thing for the evening. Ouija board. Damn. Yeah, here we go. Activity. But in comparison to what I've just experienced in the last 30, 30, 30 35 minutes. There is no comparison. This year is, in my, my own opinion, no working with spirit every day is so much more active. So I cannot wait to get going. On arrival this evening, didn't even step foot out of the car and I felt the eyes on the straight away. I met Richard at the main entrance and he got a couple of bits of equipment out. And as I was standing at the door, I felt like there was a gentleman standing behind us. Um, and I felt I had to say the name Will, William, and Sure enough, lo and behold, the equipment, first name that came out was William. Yep, visitors love this place. Yeah, it sees a lot of activity. This, uh, this was a part of the charity event uh, that goes on there. The Chronicle Sunshine Fund holds like a Halloween scare fest there. Nice. Pretty, pretty fun stuff. Another unique spirit of the castle is Lady Mary Berkeley, and she's also known as the Grey Lady. She had once been married to Lord Ford Grey, and Lord Grey inherited the castle after his father's death in 1675. In 1681, Mary had seven siblings, including a 17-year-old sister named Henrietta. At some point, their mother began snooping around, and she was suspicious of something going on between Henrietta and her sister's husband, Ford. Eventually, a letter written by Henrietta was discovered, and it read, quote, My sister Belle did not suspect our being together last night, for she did not hear the noise. Pray come again Sunday or Monday, if the last, I shall be very impatient. The letter was addressed to her sister's husband, Ford Gray, and they had been having an affair for about a year, possibly longer behind Mary's back. So their mother, Elizabeth, banned the lovers from seeing one another. Henrietta eventually escaped to London with Ford, and Ford abandoned his wife, Mary, and their infant child at Chillingham Castle. Ford was later imprisoned and found guilty 
of debauching the Earl of Berkeley's daughter, but he never received any punishment for the crime and he was later released. Today, some say you can hear the rustling of a silk dress before you see Mary's ghost sweeping through the corridors of the castle. Other times, she's been seen gazing out of the upper floor windows. She's constantly searching for her husband who abandoned her centuries ago, and she leaves a trail of freezing cold behind her. It's believed she might escape from her famous portrait that hangs in the castle in the middle of the night and returns before the morning comes. So I had never heard of these um, ghosts. They're just called silkies, but in recent years, Mary's spirit has also been considered a silky, and these types of spirits exclusively exist near the border of England and Scotland. Most silkies are friendly and harmless. They'll even supposedly tidy up your house if you let them. Mm. Other silkies might be a bit more mischievous and play pranks on you. They're often identified if they're seen wearing long silky robes, and that's what you could hear her silky dress kind of moving through the hallways and chilling him. So as for Lady Berkeley, she's considered a third type of silky. She's actually known simply as a sad silky, me in real life. Straight just to a, the point description. Sad, yeah, <laughs> right. I know. I love that. I love how they name them based on uh, just like, oh, they well, they were seen in a silky dress. Let's just call them silky. That's it. Some think she might have tried to watch over the castle as it fell into disrepair over the years. And one of the most famous silkies of the border is about 40 miles south of the castle in a quiet village called, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Black Hedden. In the mid-19th century, this village was haunted by a supernatural entity which was supposedly the original Silky. Her lore was documented in the book, According to the Haunted Homes and Family Traditions of Great Britain by John Ingram, and it was published in 1897. So it's believed that a woman had died a miserable death and she was, quote, overtaken by moral agony because I guess she knew the location of a great treasure. So she couldn't be at rest in her grave knowing that this treasure was hidden. And she was often seen wearing flowing silk robes. In the darkest and most solitary parts of the roads in Blackheaden, she would appear before lonely travelers. Sometimes she broke through the darkness in this bright flash of light. If the traveler was on horseback, sometimes she would appear on the back of the horse. And similar to Lady Berkeley, she could be heard, you know, quote, rustling in her silks. So you often hear them before you see them. When a horse would notice her presence, it would panic and bolt, and the rider would then struggle with regaining control of his horse. And after a moment, Silky would just vanish. She could also be seen a few miles outside of Blackheaden at Belse. Visitors would see her sitting in a tree of twisted branches near a waterfall, and this has become known as kind of a famous spot just known as Silky's Seat. When she wasn't in her seat, she was often terrorizing the villagers and travelers, and in one story, she picked out, of course, a farm servant to harass on a nearby bridge, now known as Silky's Bridge. I don't, I don't get why they pick out the farm servants. Like, couldn't you pick on someone a bit? I don't know. More not down on, or, yeah, yeah, not down on their similar. luck. In another tale, there was once a female servant in one of the houses in Blackheaden. She supposedly heard a noise inside the house, and when she looked up, she noticed the ceiling of the room she was standing in was collapsing. So she backed away and watched it collapse. Something described as, quote, shapeless, black, and uncouth fell into the house from the ceiling. It was so hideous, the servant didn't stop to look at it in detail. Instead, she just bolted out of there, screaming at the top of her lungs, quote, the devil's in the house. He's come through the ceiling. So obviously the rest of the family heard her screaming. They were the Heppels and they all panicked and ran. After they found each other outside, they discussed if they should even go back in and see what it was. Obviously, if someone's saying that there's a devil in the house, you know, it's like, do we even go back in there? So after a while, no more commotion stirred in the house. So the mistress ended up taking the lead and she headed back into the house with the collapsed ceiling. On the ground in the rubble was this nasty, hideous thing that caused the ceiling to give way. It was the skin of an entire black dog, head and legs and all. But when she checked it out, she noticed it was a carcass and it had been stuffed with something really heavy, which probably caused the, the ceiling to give way. And as the mistress reached inside the mouth and down the throat of this poor dog carcass, she grabbed a hold of dozens of gold coins. 
This was apparently Silky's long lost treasure and it now belonged to the Heppel family. Wow. And they lived on this gold for generations. And after this, Silky was never heard from again. Since her treasure was finally uncovered, her destiny was supposedly fulfilled here. And it's believed that more Silkies just like this one still exist in this specific border region of England and Scotland, especially in Chillingham Castle. Which leads us to another Silky story. A room inside Chillingham Castle where another silky might exist is known as the Inner Pantry. This was once used as a storage room or occasionally a holding cell, and you can rent the room for a night if you want to press your luck. Looks pretty nice. Not too bad, yeah. huh? Uh, the pantry walls are made of cold, thick stone, and it's believed this room is used to keep some of the castle's treasure at some point. Each night a guard would lock himself inside along with the treasures, and he'd be the only one with the key, so no one but him could get in or out. On one of these nights, a frail, sickly woman appeared out of thin air inside the room. She asked the guard if he could fetch a glass of water as she stumbled and held onto the nearby wall for balance. Quickly, the guard fled the room and he wasn't sure what he had just seen. He thought maybe a glass of water might make the sickly apparition go away, but when he returned with a full glass of water, the woman had already vanished. The spirit is also known as the pantry ghost. It's believed she was poisoned to death in the inner pantry, possibly through a substance mixed in a glass of water and it's believed that if you see her she's an omen of death and a member of your family might die soon after seeing her one theory is that this woman knew the location of a treasure hidden somewhere else in the castle similar to silky she might have been poisoned because she knew too much about the castle's riches and the only way to release her spirit from the castle is to follow her to the location of the hidden treasure and no one has ever successfully done it the Silky isn't the only one who died in the inner pantry. Supposedly, it's believed that a Spanish witch, also known as a Bruja, was murdered here ages ago. It isn't clear exactly how she died, but her last words were a curse. She made it so that anyone who took anything from the castle would experience bad luck. And people, uh, as they usually do, try to steal stuff from these types of locations. And uh, bad luck, to say the least, has befallen many of these people who've done this. And they have actually returned these stolen items back to the castle understandable i love i love that caveat though because it's like this one silky's like i need to take you to this treasure so you can find it and take it but then there's this witch who put a curse it's on like, the castle ah, ah, like, nobody's taken anything yeah another legend mentions the large trees that surround the castle and out past the castle garden there's this pathway that kind of leads into the forested area some of the largest trees you'll see here are the European yews, and in one area there's these three massive yews once stood. Unfortunately today two of them have fallen, but one of the original ones is still standing. They have a really unique look to them. Uh, they're kind of lumpy in their, in their trunk, and at the end of their branches they have dark green needles and red berry-like seed pods. Actually, this is a fun fact. The structure of the ancient yew trees actually inspired the look of the Whomping Willow. You know that from the Harry Potter series. Because mm -hmm. um, it's funny, the Whomping Willow doesn't really look like a willow, especially in the movie. It's, uh, it looks more like a yew tree. But in the Middle Ages, the wood from the yews was used to make musical instruments, furniture, longbows. But they were also super poisonous. And... Some suggest that these surrounding yews might have been used to poison the pantry ghost to kill her. If you were to eat even a small amount of their foliage, it could be fatal. But despite how poisonous they are, they're honestly beautiful trees. And unfortunately, these three specific yews at Chillingham are known to be the location of just more forms of torture and execution. As the story goes, soldiers would often take prisoners of war, criminals, or sometimes just people loitering around the castle that they didn't want nearby, and they'd hang them in the trees. But they wouldn't hang them how you normally hang them, someone by the neck, right? They would actually strip them naked, tie a rope around their waist, and then hoist them up. Some were hanged upside down by their ankles, and the victims would just die from hunger, thirst, or compression of the rope on the lungs and organs. So they would, it's, it wasn't just to like snap your neck or choke you or anything. And it could sometimes take 10 to 14 days to die. Oh my God. So it was basically just a passive form of awful torture. Um, 
But one of these stories at Chillingham was the story of these three monks who were passing by the castle, you know, centuries ago. There's not really an exact date for this, but they saw several people hanging naked from the yews and their skin was blistering from exposure and they begged for water. So the monks approached the hanging victims. They tried to cover them up with some clothes to give them some dignity in their final moments and protect them from the sun. They also fetched some water, but when the guards from the castle saw them doing this, they then seized the monks and then just ended up hanging them too. God. Which is crazy. Usually monks, usually like back in, in those days, yeah. religious monks people. And nuns and, yeah, yeah, they were kind of off limits to this, but. Not at Chilliam. Yeah. Like, hang them all, I guess. No good deeds here. Yeah, honestly. Many of the bodies were left to hang for weeks until they eventually fell to the ground and decayed or some were eaten by scavengers. Today, many claim that the bones of the deceased can still be found in the soil beneath these trees. And since they were never given a proper burial, you know, that's usually a big indication that these spirits will just wander around, especially in this clearing that leads to these trees. Apparitions that look suspiciously like monks, uh, they're often dressed in robes, are often witnessed crossing the grounds. And at night, some have heard painful whimpers up in the tree branches where they would be hanged. This episode of Lights Out is brought to you by Every Plate. Every Plate is now owned by HelloFresh, a leading meal kit company. Sizzle your way into the new year with $1 steak for life. Did you hear me right? Yeah, you did. $1 steak for life. Simply add a 10 ounce ranch steak to your weekly order for just $1 per box while your subscription is active. Now that's what I call raising the steaks for dinner. You know what? It's time to get your butt out of the grocery store. I know I'm sick of going there. The prices are too high. It gets confusing. I get lost. I feel like a little kid in there. Every plate provides plenty of delicious variety with more than 25 tasty and affordable recipes that change every week. I love that they rotate it. It never gets old. Sometimes, yeah, there'll be like zucchini in this one, zucchini in that one. But the way that you make it always makes it kind of just something new. So freshens up your week a little bit right josh oh yeah i love me a baked zucchini a roasted zucchini a pan fried zucchini yeah a spiralized zucchini, spiralized maybe. yeah mm, so good it's easy to find something flavorful and satisfying for every meal of the day like breakfast 24 7 15 minutes or less meals feel good food and big batch fave plus Add even more delicious options to your order with over 25 convenient sides, breakfast items, lunches, snacks, desserts, and more. So get a meal for $1.49 plus $1 steaks for life by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code 49 lights out. Subscription must be active to qualify and redeem $1 steak. Get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal, plus $1 stakes for life by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code 49 lights out. Subscription must be active to qualify and redeem for $1 stake. I mean, it all makes sense to me. I mean, if there's going to be anywhere paranormal, where paranormal activity is going to exist, it's this place. Yeah, I mean, honestly. Just the amount of, of death and violence. Violence. Yeah. And, um, destruction is seriously I think enough to make anyone believe another area outside the castle walls is known as the devil's walk or devil's mile this is the main roadway to get in and out of the castle and it's only about a quarter of a mile but at one point it stretched much further many who visit the castle exit after the night tours when the sun is already down and some have claimed that blood stains can be seen in the driveway and the grounds that lead to the main gates Others have experienced strange electric phenomena while approaching and leaving castle grounds. Batteries have instantly drained and microphones have cut out or picked up strange noises. Light anomalies and orbs have also been spotted. And some have also heard disembodied footsteps when no one else is around. And just like the area with the large yew trees, people have found fragments of human bones scattered along Devil's Mile. Supposedly the English also hang the bodies of Scottish soldiers and prisoners of war in the trees that line Devil's Mile to deter enemies from approaching. Just like the victims at the yew trees, their bodies would decay and fall to the ground and most never got a proper burial, like many of the others who died horrific deaths at the castle. 
So with all the violence and torture and carnage inside and outside the castle through the years, it is no wonder that so many people have gone to Chilliam Castle and have had strange experiences or, you know, felt sick leaving too. Like a lot of people who've stayed there end up falling ill after leaving for, for some time. I mean, it's just a very negative space. Yeah. Richard Craig, the resident ghost hunter, shout out Richard has a long running list of apparitions witnessed at the castle. Many of them have different backgrounds and existed at different times throughout the centuries, but most of them have one thing in common. They were all involved in some form of tragedy at Chillingham Castle. Luckily, tragedy is now rare at the castle these days, uh, so it seems like there's not really any immediate danger to visiting, but the unlucky spirits that reside there, especially from the 1300s, are just stuck there, it seems like, for the rest of time. But today, Chillingham is still open for tours, ghost hunts, and room reservations. But it's definitely not for the faint of heart. So, you know, if you really uh, are worried about somewhere like this impacting you physically, mentally, spiritually, then maybe yes, stay away. Yeah, take a pass on this one. So that, that leads us to our final thoughts. Do we really believe that this place is haunted? And, you know, there's a lot of explanations out there it's kind of like open to interpretation as to why places become haunted and you know what what's actually going on here and i found a very interesting post from again no way to verify that this person is a medium but somebody who uh says that they're a medium and you know they kind of gave a very interesting explanation i want to share on just go spirits in general and you know what what's actually going on there so this person is anima lumen um, from Reddit, and this person says, well, as someone who wholeheartedly believes in ghosts, spirits, and is well-versed in the subject, I am a medium, so naturally I've just done a ton of research into the subject, plus I've gathered via my own experiences with discarnate, disincarnate beings. Death is when the spirit becomes permanently severed from the physical vessel it is bound to during life, and once the body can no longer hold the spirit, or the spirit, for whatever reasons, decides it's time to move on, it transitions from being bound to the material realm to not being bound to it. A spirit transitioning from being to incarnate to disincarnate is a very complex process and it definitely varies in every situation. There are levels to how present or tangible a spirit can be. Spirits are those souls that have entirely transitioned, meaning there's nothing really anchoring them and keeping them here forcibly. They may choose to linger in some capacity, most of the time depending on the people they left behind. This is, for example, when people who will claim like grandma's still with us, sometimes I get hints for a perfume or hear a laugh and I know she is with me. This is also what a lot of people may even refer to as a spirit guide. Mediums with enough experience can also summon these spirits and beckon them to approach the veil in order to communicate. Spirits who have transitioned are basically several layers removed from the material plane we exist on. So what you describe about a veil is quite fitting in that regard. It's very much like looking at someone through a window. And this is why their presence is usually not as tangible and it's not as easy to communicate with them. There is, however, spirits that are still anchored to the material plane, which makes sense for Chillingham Castle. Even though they no longer have a physical body they are anchored to, these are what you typically hear as, of, as ghosts, and what you've seen described in the media stuck and unable to move on, having unfinished business. Ghosts are usually more tangible. In a way, they're on this side of the window, if that makes sense, and they are present on the same plane of existence as we are, but they do not have a vessel to hold on to. The veil that separates spirits from those of us still in a body is really only applicable to those who have moved on. Those who have not moved on because they have, they have something that keeps them here are anchored into the physical plane they were once a part of because there's something quite dense keeping them around. Uh, for example, I once came across the ghost of a woman who died by her own hand. She was stuck due to her own grief and guilt over leaving her young children behind. She did not die at peace and in fact her death was quite traumatic. The unresolved trauma and other dense emotions she held when she transitioned from this world were literally an anchor that kept her from being able to pierce the veil and basically cross over to the other side. Very, a very, you know, well thought out yes. explanation or theory. Yeah, super summed up. And uh, this seems to be kind of in line with a lot of paranormal stories that we come across, especially the part where it's like there's something unresolved. And I think that's a core point if it's unresolved trauma if they yeah guilty or like there's something that's keeping them here for some reason because in their life 
it was unresolved. I think that's like a common thing we see in a lot of ghost stories. Which Chillingham Castle is full of unresolved death and trauma. Right. So in this theory, it would make sense why there would be so much ghost activity. Right. Because there's so many spirits that haven't pierced the veil, haven't crossed over completely to the other side because they're trapped here due to all of the, the negative energy and emotions uh, and, and events that transpired. So it makes a lot of sense. Now, on the flip side, maybe you're uh, more skeptical, you know, and you two are a little bit more skeptical than I am when it comes to the paranormal. What do you think about some of the scientific explanations in this particular location? You think they hold some I, I prudence think, here? Like, I think things, it's hard with like the devices. I don't know the ins and outs of a lot of these devices that they're using. I don't know what brand it is. I, I think it's hard to say because I don't know the ins and outs and it's not like I can crack those things open and take a look at what's actually operating inside them. So, and that's me as a skeptic. I want to see the, the really hard details in there. I want to see how these things are actually operating or I just want someone, it would be nice if just somebody could just explain, here's exactly how these devices work. And I just get a complete, so maybe it's just thought that's on my end. I'm maybe a little bit ignorant to these devices um, and I need to do a little more research on them. But that's where I, it's hard for me to believe the devices are actually detecting something. Also things like, I don't know, electromagnetic fields like EMF. It's like, there's a lot of electromagnetic things happening, you know, I, so it's hard to say that this is definitive proof one way or another or temperature changes. It's like, is it just a draft? Did someone be, is it a, somebody left a door open? Is some waft of cold air coming up from the dungeon somehow? You know, there's like, there's so many factors that I'm like, I wish I could get more of just a scientific brain in there to really explain everything down to the nitty gritty detail. Well, um, if you think about it from, from that perspective, a lot of the locations that have extensive paranormal activity are older in nature. And so if you think about the construction of these buildings and, you know, like this was what renovated in like the 80s. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I would be curious to see like, what does the wiring look like? Right. How insulated is the wiring here? Because EMF could be, like you said, a range of different things. It could be faulty wiring. It could be, there could be something within the walls that's emitting it that we can't see. And so our meter's going off, but there's actually a, a logical explanation for why it's being picked up in this particular place and that's that's one thing that like as a ghost hunter going into it uh, another level of investigation that you should be doing is also like can i get the plans can i see you know what are the the renovation plans do we know what kind of wiring is used do we know if that wiring is insulated do we know that's, you know see, what's going on within the walls that's and, the type of shit that would convince me if someone was actually doing the nitty-gritty research on a building like that i would be way more like an inspector to, like a yeah. building inspector would mm -hmm. go into a building and there's tools to see what's behind the walls and check temperatures and like figure out if there's something that's emitting you know emf like running your emf reader across the wall to see if it goes off would be a great great place to start in a paranormal investigation because then you can determine is there something within the wall that's actually causing the EMF meter to go, go off in the middle of the room? And I, oftentimes I don't see that happen. Like the, yeah. the very basic steps to rule out the most logical things for, for some of this activity is never done. And it just goes immediately to let's, let's talk about spirits, let's talk about ghosts. And that's fun. And, and I think that makes for good entertainment. But if you're really trying to investigate this truly as like, a scientific researcher like i think it's worth doing some of the due diligence to rule out the logical explanations before you jump to like the paranormal ones right yeah and like you said too i think it doesn't make for great media and mm -hmm. i think that's yeah. why no who one wants, wants to that? watch a building inspector like <laughs> yeah, all right, right this wall <laughs> right so it's like it wouldn't make for a good youtube channel right but i i would appreciate like even if it was just off screen you didn't even have to do it but you could just show me that you actually did the work that you really researched what was going on to this. You know the history well. Right. Because I think a lot of the people, and no offense to them, because it's fun, but they just go in there, they know John Sage, and that's it. And they're like, John, are you here? And then it's like, It's John. like John and Edward. Yeah. And it's like, they kind of all just do the minimal surface level research. And 
and to get it and it's fun i mean and they get some cool content out there and uh, i don't have anything necessarily against that but just as a skeptic i think watching them i'm like i want someone to dig a little bit deeper into this to try and convince me of something going on here or like oh with the sounds there's there's like infrasound uh that you know low low emitting sound uh waves and I also really question sounds in paranormal investigations, especially when people are split up because it's like, well, you're experiencing the sound in this room, but where's everybody else at this very moment that this sound is being heard, right? True. Is somebody walking over here and like in an old building or a castle or something, there's probably creaks and moans and for sure, you know, banging could have been somebody dropping a piece of equipment upstairs, but down here you're by yourself and you're like, oh, this bang came out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, you know, it's hard to, to really know what's going on when you're only seeing one piece of it it'd be great to see like a paranormal investigation with like cameras on all the investigators at all time live feeds of everybody in all the different rooms and i think i think some of them do this out there but you know so when one sound is heard and they're hearing it another sound we can verify that oh it wasn't somebody in the room above you that dropped dropped a tripod or something on right the and that's the sound that you're hearing that's a good point but then there's obviously like toxic hallucinations so when you talk about apparitions and you know people seeing visual activity a lot of people you know are like oh yeah, that was a apparition but it's also possible that based on materials that were used it could be carbon monoxide it could be formaldehyde pesticides i mean there's endless types of materials that are toxic to the brain maybe they took one of those yew tree berries and popped it before they yeah, went in the castle yeah. and chewing on a yew yew leaf or something yeah. you know like you never know that there could be something else going on. I mean, there's so many, think about all the different substances and gases and things like that that are invisible to the human eye right. that could be around you impacting your perception of reality for and you have no idea. Or maybe, for all we know, they all smoked a bowl before they went in <laughs> or, you know, or, or dropped some, some LSD before going in. And so some of that is, so there's like all these, you know, if you really want to do a sound investigation, it's like we have to like, you got to, really follow the scientific method like right. what's our control what's our variables here and, yeah and document it in such a way versus like le- going in with this this biased point of view of like this is an extremely haunted location the most haunted castle in all of england and having that perception going into it definitely fucks with you and i, was, I know that i was just hand. gonna say that yeah because uh, i i know i've brought this up before but i think the unconscious mind is super powerful so when you go into an area and you're like i know there's been a lot of death there's a lot of torture i've heard the stories and i know that other people have reported on this place being extremely haunted you're now already predisposed to something you'll maybe interpret as supernatural just because your unconscious is at play and you know all these factors exist there you know and it's i don't know how you overcome that i don't know how you even go into a place like chillingham with a neutral mindset because you just you know it's haunted right right it's like that's the appeal of places like this so it's it's a hard uh i don't know it's a hard balance beam to try and turn your mind away from those things to try and shut off those preconceived notions right I think it'd be interesting really to drop impossible. somebody in to chillingham castle for an overnight stay who's never Didn't know. heard of this place before yeah the history and see and if they come back and they're like whoa this was the craziest night of my life so much weird shit happened to me yeah that to me would be very compelling right for like, sure well, they didn't know that and then you're like oh yeah dude this place is super haunted ton of people have died here and what you were experiencing was spirits and ghosts and you know whatever other kind of entities that roam this place last night and kind of get that perspective because yeah everybody's going in with the preconceived notion that this is extremely haunted so i'm expecting haunted things to happen right and i've done that i've done that firsthand with the stanley hotel and oh yeah and actually it backfired on me majorly because nothing happened yeah and i and you know i stayed in the one of the haunted rooms there that people have a ghost getting in bed with you and so was that like the stephen king room yeah yeah yeah. yeah. and i that's why i respect you because i know you're a big believer but you didn't try to bullshit yourself into thinking that something was happening no i just cried at the end of it because (laughs) You, you spent all that money and nothing yeah. happened yeah, yeah and, and you know to end this episode maybe we'll throw that that little clip in there uh we, oh, have, a, we yeah. have a little uh clip that i have in my archives from 
from that uh, little investigation that we did. And uh, this was a few years back, so don't judge me, but <laughs> it was a very sad day for me. You can clearly see the disappointment that I, I experienced in the, the Stanley Hotel after spending all this money. I think I've seen like an hour yeah. of raw footage of that. It's hilarious. But it's yeah, it's, funny. Josh was bummed though, which is, I don't know. It's, it's like, but I still respect you for just being honest about what you did and didn't experience. Where you stand on all this, Daniel? I mean, I know I've mentioned this probably a few times at this point, but if there is any place that's going to be haunted, it's going to be a place that is older. You know, having a history, I think, is important. I don't know why, but I can't get behind something that's like 20 years old being haunted. I don't know why. I think the older it is, the more haunt, the more likelihood of it uh, being haunted. But obviously, a place with a lot of human tragedy is going to be, you know, an epicenter for you know, spirits and all these things. And when you guys mentioned that if someone goes back to this, if someone goes to Chillingham Castle and they have no idea that it's haunted, I think they would still feel weird at night because obviously it's ancient. It, yeah, it, it, yeah. It's obviously an old place. There's obviously a lot of history. So I think especially in the dark, the mind would just kind of wander and you'd probably start to think about someone probably did die here. It's a, it's a 13th century castle. Right. People have probably died here, even if they don't know about the history of it. And I think they would probably still experience things. But I think going into it, having a healthy amount of skepticism is going to be the best way to do it. Yeah. Like you did with the uh, Stanley. Uh, Stanley Hotel. You went yeah. with a healthy amount of skepticism. You are a believer, but you did, you realized what's real, what's not. And I think that's what's going to eventually convince me to believe is I need someone who is a skeptic to kind of prove it if that yeah makes any sense. yeah versus yeah versus just kind of going in like immediately right off the bat like oh shit you hear yeah. that you see that and you know it's 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 fun and yeah. maybe and again maybe it did happen maybe everything that's happening in these these youtube videos and you know ghost hunting episodes on tv are, are legit i mean i don't know for sure i wasn't there but in, in their defense, it's not like, I don't think a lot of these channels are trying to convince a non-believer into no. believing. So they're just, I mean, it's mostly the people that want to watch that stuff kind of already are, n believe in ghosts, right? Believe in spirits like that. So like, it's no fault of their own. If you take it as a scientific experiment on whether or not you're trying to prove ghosts are real, science, nine times out of 10, the process isn't super exciting. Yeah, it, it's boring. a lot. It's a lot of documentation. It's, it's very boring. It doesn't Go watch the good. history channel if you or like... Uh, <laughs> discovery channel if you want like a bunch of scientists <laughs> roaming around yeah, you know? exactly it doesn't make good entertainment so you're right. right i mean all these all these shows they're for the believers and it's kind of entertain them it's not to convince non-believers right i would be down for a very boring yeah. very boring scientific based like experiment experiment but i would watch it I would maybe, watch there, it. maybe there's an untapped market <laughs> yeah. a very boring scientific paranormal hunt that's what, we're gonna, that's what i'm gonna do <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll just read yeah. poetry half the time. <laughs> we'll read poems to the the spirits and see what happens, and and conduct our scientific method. <laughs> Maybe we'll instead of the the normal like black get up wall, we we'll wearing like white lab coats. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll Glasses, be ready. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the goggles. But yeah, we want to know your thoughts on Chillingham Castle. Obviously, you know, what do you think? Is it is it haunted? You know, what what do you believe? You know some of the the youtube videos and what they experience i'd love to know your thoughts you know and uh, shout out to all those guys that we we featured in the, the episode today you know big fans that's why we included them and you know i think what they're doing is is really cool i mean honestly it's the dream that's like the dream oh man job would just be travel around and do overnight stays oh <laughs> i'm so jealous i'm like god they seem to be having so much fun too yeah they do it, it seems like a blast so but yeah well we're gonna leave this episode uh with uh a very sad clip of me realizing I'm not going to experience uh, anything paranormal at the infamous Stanley Hotel. But uh, until next time, lights out, everybody. Well, maybe we should just go home tonight, huh? No, I don't think I go home tonight. Oh, I'm, I'm just joking, baby. You don't have to actually be disappointed. It's okay. It's not a big deal. We can either. You, you can either make a video just on the Stanley, or we can just cancel it, like you said.